Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lonnie Merrick, co-chair of the Chapel Hill Carboro uh, NAACP Health and Wellness Committee. And in recognition of Black history this month, we're doing a presentation uh, entitled Black to the Future, Our History, Our Health, and Our Choices. Thank you all for being here this evening. I know there's a lot of other things you'd probably like to be doing. But uh, it's great of you to be with us to help celebrate and illuminate our past during this very special time. Uh, I would like to give thanks to our speakers this evening as well. Uh, one, Dr. William Munn, who's a senior policy analyst at the North Carolina Justice Institute, and Dr. Alan Mask of Chapel Hill, who's the uh, medical director for Raleigh. Uh, you guys have been very generous with your time and your help in putting this program together, and I much appreciate it. I also want to give a shout out and thanks to my co-chair of the Health and Wellness Committee, Rebecca Cerise, who is the wizard behind the curtain that makes it all happen. Thank you very much. Uh, but before we get started, I want to give a big plug for our sister project, uh, which is the Sleeves Up Black to the Future Blood Drive campaign. This is a campaign we've been running with the American Red Cross now for, and will continue through this month for Black History Month to uh, help get blood. I'm sorry to say that the response has been very tepid uh, to date, but I'm sure you're all aware that there's an ongoing critical blood shortage of blood products and uh, black blood donors in particular are needed. Approximately 13% of the US population is black and only 3% of blood donors identify as African-Americans. So please, if you can try to participate in, in our program by contacting the American Red Cross at the link on the screen or it will be included as well on the slide. I also want to emphasize that this campaign is not exclusive to African Americans. All are welcome and eagerly encouraged to donate. Thanks in, in advance. And uh, if you can, bring a friend and spread the word. And this actually is a perfect segue into our historical headliner tonight, Dr. Charles Drew, who was one of the early pioneers of blood banking. You may have heard mention of the Drew Medical Center in Southern California, uh, the Drew Bridge in, in uh, Washington, DC, or even the Drew Community Health Center in Burlington, North Carolina. He's the guy I'm here to talk about, Dr. Charles Drew, the man, the myth, our history. He was born June 3rd, 1904 in Washington, DC, uh, and grew up uh, one of five children. His father was a carpet layer and his mother was trained as a teacher. Uh, he went on to graduate from Washington's famed Dunbar High School and matriculated to Amherst College in Massachusetts. He was very athletic and competitive and went there on an athletic scholarship on football and track. He was motivated to go on to medical school after the death of his sister during the 1918 flu epidemic. And after graduating from Amherst in 1926, he taught chemistry and biology for two years at the historically black Morgan College in Baltimore, Maryland. After that, Drew attended medical school at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, where he received a doctor of medicine and a master of surgery degree. He was second in his class. While at McGill, he worked with a gentleman who was doing research on blood transfusion and treatments for hypovolemic shock. Together, they realized that transfusion was one solution to treating patients in shock, but they were very limited because at the time there was no successful method for mass storage or transportation of blood. After medical school, he went to Harvard, to uh, Howard University in Washington and became a faculty instructor in pathology. At that time also, he served as an instructor and an assistant surgeon 
at Howard's affiliated hospital, the then Freedman's Hospital. After that, you know, after he went uh, and did postgraduate work in Columbia University in New York City, he did a two year Rockefeller surgical fellowship. There, he became the first African American to earn a Doctor of Medicine degree, which is different than an MD degree. His doctoral thesis was entitled Bank Blood A Study on Preservation. Through his research, he, he determined that blood plasma was able to be preserved for two months uh, instead of the then usual one week. And this was a major leap. And he was able to do this by separating the two major components of blood, the blood from the plasma and using centrifugation and other manipulations. His work quickly became internationally recognized because of the importance on the face of it and the surging need for blood that was triggered by the beginning of World War II in Europe. To that point in 1940, he was recruited to set up and administer an early prototype program for blood storage and preservation to help with the war effort in New York. He stayed on in New York City as medical director for the Blood for Britain program which was a project designed to collect blood in America and send to the British. During this time, he conceived of and started mobile blood collection and storage units uh, that later would become known as blood mobiles. The Blood for Britain program operated successfully for about five months with total collections from about 15,000 people. Later in February, 1941, uh, Drew was appointed director of the first American Red Cross Bank, and this was located in New York City. But to give you an idea of what the climate was that this man had to operate in, when the American Red Cross blood banks across America were first opened, the U.S. Armed Forces initially announced that Black donors would be excluded. But later, after much pullback, they ruled that the blood of African-Americans could be accepted, but would have to be stored separately from that of whites. Because of this, Drew resigned in protest in 1942, writing, as you know, there is no scientific basis for the separation of bloods of different races, except on the basis of individual blood types or groups. This segregation of black and white blood was officially followed as a national, nationwide policy by the Red Cross until 1950. He returned to the Freedman's Hospital after his resignation and worked as a surgeon and professor of medicine until uh, his untimely death. On April 1st, 1950, while he was driving from Washington to DC to Tuskegee, Alabama, to participate in an annual free medical clinic, he was in an automobile accident. He was traveling with three other African-American physicians and they were trying to drive through the night. It's important, I think, to note here that one reason they were traveling all night from Washington to Tuskegee was because of the lack of accommodations in the South for black travelers at that time. They crashed in rural Alamance County on Highway 49 in the very early hours of the morning, Dr. Drew sustained uh, severe injuries and was taken to the nearest hospital, which happens to be Alamance General Hospital in Burlington, North Carolina. I, I worked there on occasion, so is Dr. Mass. Uh, he died soon after being taken there. Now, this crash occurred on Highway 49 just near Haw River. But you know, there was another collision that day. And this was one at the intersection of myth, legend, and history. History is not just the facts or the actual events, but also what people experience. The legend of Dr. Drew's death was born out of the prevailing Black experience in the first part of the 20th century. It wasn't unusual at that time for Blacks to be refused admission and even life-saving emergency medical care. 
when they could get treated, often the treatment was substandard. Indeed, many tragic incidents and appalling statistics from each era of Black history have been documented by medical historians and credible news accounts. The legend took root and grew in the real suffering that people endured and mirrors real life incidents that actually happened to African-Americans at the time. One doesn't have to look very far. The legend continues to hang on today and indeed, I've heard it repeated myself. The legend has several versions. One, he died because he was refused admission. Two, he died because he was refused a blood transfusion. Three, he died because he got inadequate care because he was black. All of the above have been discounted repeatedly by the facts of record and by multiple eyewitness accounts including some of the black physicians with which he was riding in the automobile that day. It's interesting to note that the rumors started within hours of his death and they started in multiple locations, in North Carolina where he died, in Baltimore where he worked, in Alabama where he was headed. The rumor, the legend came to full life in print in 1964 with the first documented written account of the legend. And it was in an article by Whitney Young, the noted civil rights leader and social worker. The darkly ironic and compelling story took a life of its own in other print speeches and even on several TV shows like MASH. It was often repeated as fact and successfully utilized over the years to garner support for the civil rights movement. Noted historian Alan Nevins once wrote, on the granite of hard fact grows the moss of legend and even pure myth contains the grains of stony reality. The legend is not literally true, but the racial history and injustices of the period gave it fertile ground for growth and it spread. And it speaks to the larger truth of the conditions that blacks experienced trying to seek medical care at that time. But let's take a look back even further and see what conditions from the past might correlate with some of today's disparities in healthcare in North Carolina. And to do this, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. William Munn, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Mary. I appreciate it. I'm going to take a couple of seconds and transition this um, slideshow here. All right, can everyone see that first slide? Yes. All right, wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you about health and wealth in North Carolina. I'm excited to share some research that I've compiled that connects uh, the wealth of slavery to the disinvested spaces we see throughout North Carolina. And of course, the correlations between uh, slaveholding counties and health outcomes that we see uh, today. And so when we think about North Carolina economically, we, we often visualize skyscrapers and the metropolitan homes of our, our various collegiate institutions and an interstate system that can take you from uh, Wilmington to Asheville in less than a work day. Uh, but that North Carolina is not the reality for many of our neighbors. And uh, this map of North Carolina's uh, Department of Commerce's economic distress system AKA tier system is, is, is evidence of that. The counties in Burgundy are tier one uh, or the most economically distressed. Yellow counties are tier two, uh, blue counties are tier three or the least economically distressed. Um, and several measures are, uh, are used to classify the 100 counties. Average unemployment rate, median household income, percentage growth in population and adjusted property tax base per capita. And what we see here is strikingly similar to the tier one counties on a previous map. Uh, these are the 29 black belt counties as defined by the literature. And this literature took into account the agrarian and isolated nature of this region of the South. This is where the cotton plantation slave system was implanted and many of the residual harms still persist today, particularly in the area of health. 
So this is an actual map of the 88 counties in North Carolina in 1860. Uh, it is color coded to show what percentage of the county's total population were enslaved people. Um, and as you see in Eastern North Carolina where the cotton plantation economy was strongest, predictably there were more enslaved counties. People, I'm sorry. But doesn't this map look familiar, eerily familiar to the one that I just shared? Well, it's real familiar. So essentially, the tier one counties that we see today in 2022 have a strikingly similar uh, spatial orientation to what we see um, today um, in 1860, I'm sorry. So when we think about health outcomes from a critical race lens today, uh, and the multiple drivers, they segment and segment in so many different ways. For example, this is the same 1860 enslaved population map, except overlaid are the permitted animal facilities of 2020. The white dots are swine farms where uh, there have been an enormously negative environmental impact on the surrounding watersheds. And who wants a swine farm in their backyard? However, corporate interests have waged a psychological war on the residents down east, convincing them that their livelihood is tied to the large scale uh, commercial meat processing and whatever economic or physical consequence might befall the community. To them, they're told that that suffering must be absorbed and ignored, particularly in the area of health. So I hope that, that has sufficiently framed the context for my broader com discussion. And that is that we have a region in North Carolina, the Black Belt, that has been historically damaged by slavery, intentional underinvestment and racism. And when we consider that the effective health, pol health access policy, if we consider, if we're going to seriously consider that, we have to fully consider the layers of trauma, both ancient and re recent, before we can meet success. So interestingly enough, North Carolina reflected a very different um, reality from this map in 1860, which brings me to my first question that I'll explore with you today. What did wealth look like in 19th century North Carolina? And this is very important because wealth and health are inextricably linked, right? So in 1860, there were 331,000 enslaved Africans from Benin, Gambia, Ghana, and other West African empires, right? So that made uh, North Carolina the most, the 10th richest state in the United States, helping to build about $11 billion of wealth for about 35,000 slave owners. So if we had just taken in 1865, $1 for uh, in earnings uh, that, these, that these enslaved Africans created, if $1 had been invested in 1860, I'm sorry, at a 10% annual return, anyone who does need investment recognizes that that's not out the realm of possibility. There will be enough money today to send every 2022 African American graduating senior in North Carolina to North Carolina a and State University, the best university in the world, uh, to 1,935 times. Every graduating senior, almost 2,000 times on a full ride scholarship equating to about $1.5 trillion and 35 cents. Think, just think about the incredible wealth, $1 out of what they would have earned their, uh, their, their slaveholders. So we know that wealth was equally distributed uh, throughout North Carolina. In fact, counties with more slaves in 1860, like Mississippi, were the wealthiest in the country, uh, only to be the poorest in the country presently. And this is a map that, again, illustrates where the enslaved lived in North Carolina and the incredible wealth in those counties. So I'd like to take a look at a couple of those actual specific counties. What happened to the wealth of Warren County? Well, in 1860, they had about 10,400 enslaved Africans which made Warren County the fourth richest county in the, in, in the state, building about $613 million for about 5,325 free people. 161 years later, Warren County ranks as the 11th most economically distressed in North Carolina. Let's take a look at another county. What happened to Edgecombe County since 1860? In 1860, 10,000 enslaved Africans from those West African empires were enslaved and made Edgecombe County the richest non in North Carolina, building about $727 million of wealth 
uh, for 672 slaveholders. Again, 161 years later, uh, North Edgecombe County ranks as the most economically distressed county in the state as according to the tier system. And so what happened in the last 161 years? Intentional disinvestment, a broken school funding formula, refusal to diversify economies, industries. Boy, I have stories for you on that. And economic impact of structural racism. Let's just call it what it is. And what does it cause? It's caused incredible disparity in black counties versus white counties, black spaces versus white spaces, um, non-white spaces versus white spaces. And so when we, when we see here, is a um, is uh, is a uh, is our our graphs that show different health indicators between United States, Vance County, Wake County, and Warren County. And you start to see here uh, that stroke amongst adults is higher. Physical health um, is higher. Physical health not good for fourteen days are higher in Vance and, and Warren counties. And as we go through every indicator. Those two counties, Warren and Vance County, have have considerably worse health outcomes uh, in those spaces. And so, just moving along here, what it says is that racism is unhealthy. Uh, a lot of my work revolves around healthcare access and health equity. And so, you know, we can predict, you know, generally where we see racism, where it has the impact. And so what we see here is our health outcome measures measured by census tract. Um, and so we'll take a look at chronic, uh, I think we're going to go to diabetes. Well, let's be up. Chronic kidney uh, disease prevalence. You'll start to see that band of census tracts uh, going from northeastern North Carolina, the predictable band, black belt band uh, that we see time and time again. And, it, and, and I can follow up with you and share this video with you, share these resources with you. Literally for every one of these measures, you'll, you're going to see the same kind of outcomes. So the legacy of the Black Belt on present day health outcomes. Again, as I said, we, uh, my, my um, director and I were, we did an incredible study a couple, I think it was two years ago. Um, and we said, hey, you know, we hypothesized that uh, racist ideology and policy took deeper roots in, in the regions with higher proportions of enslaved people. And we we said it allows systems of oppression and isolation to flourish long after emancipation. So we wanted to explore the relationship between the prevalence of slavery in North Carolina in 1860 and present day socio-health outcomes. And so we expected to find correlations between the number of enslaved and various indicators. It's suggesting that while the formal institution of slavery was dissolved some 150 years ago, intentional forms of control stretch far into the 20th century, blunting African-American progress through policy designed to keep them disenfranchised, uh, uh, dependent, and unhealthy. And so what we found here, what you see here is this block of, of counties, and I'm just going to quickly go through a visual representation of a couple of the socio-demographic relationships that we see spatially here. So non-white uh, population in North Carolina counties, that's, that's predictable, but then why would diabetes prevalence look exactly the same? Access to opportunity, ex exercise opportunities in North Carolina. And these are all measures uh, either from the, census, from the United States Census Bureau. Age adjusted mortality in North Carolina. Child poverty in North Carolina counties. Food environment food insecurity, home ownership, life expectancy, median household income, poor or fair health in, 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 in North Carolina counties, preventable hospital stays, severe housing cost burden, unemployment, uninsured, the number of percent of uninsured, years of potential life loss in North Carolina, <clears throat> and, and severe housing problems in North Carolina. Again, we're going back here to the slave population uh, map in North Carolina just to give us that 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 baseline, and so we, the analysis said you know we looked at the 86 counties in North in North Carolina in 1860 and slave populations we matched them with the 20 socio health factors from 2019. So 1860 slave populations, 2019 health outcomes. Is there a relationship between the 1860 county level populations of enslaved African Americans and present day socio health outcomes? 
Well, of course. Yes, there was. And actually, the most interesting relationship was between food insecurity and and um, and 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 in positive health outcomes or negative health outcomes um, in African Americans. And so, this is these are just a couple of um, scatter plots to sort of show folk the relationships. Every one of those count dots are counties, and we see the 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 tighter the mass around that line, that fit line, the tighter the relationship. And so we see here that there has been a relationship with, with practically every one of these factors. Excuse me, I have somebody in the front of, front of my house and I apologize, it keeps going off. So um, two minutes over, I apologize. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I hope that this has made the point uh, crystal clear that there's certainly relationships between uh, present uh, past day past um, oppression and um, and present day outcomes with regard to health. If we're going to talk about health access, if we're going to talk about health disparities, if we're going to talk about lessons learned with regard to COVID nineteen, hey, we've got to take a, a hard look at the that the ideology that created this mess and ensure that the ideology. Uh, of deservedness or less than or people don't deserve who don't deserve things is absent from that policy moving forward. So happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for having me and um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much. That was excellent. So Elizabeth Young asked um, Dr. Mun, where is your work published? Thank you for this. I have uh, a personal website where I um, will be happy to direct you, uh, willmun.com, um, where I have a, a lot of this information. And um, But uh, just shoot me your, your email address, and I'll be happy to send you uh, slides and things like that. Happy, I'll be happy to dance your, at, your, at your wedding as well. Are there any other questions right now for Will? Um, you can either put it in the chat or raise your hand. That particular article was published in the North Carolina Medical Journal, though, Elizabeth. Well, thank you. I, I, can, I can send you that, that link. Very, very just thorough and so, Val, I mean, you know, as a former health professional, it's just so every single detail is there and it's so glaringly just truthful. I mean, it's a, just brilliant and, and, you know, so much was never done before and that that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thanks again, Will. Uh, now, without further ado, uh, we'll, the next step of this is that we see what the problem is, what we've got, and Dr. Mast is gonna tell us what we can do to try to narrow the gap. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, can I be heard okay? Is my voice okay? Yeah, okay. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Merrick, uh, for allowing me to be here uh, to Lots of uh, people you in the planning committee could have invited. I'm so happy to, to sit here before you. Um, this is such an important time to be talking about healthcare disparities, especially during the time of a pandemic, and gives us the opportunity to look at uh, the health of ourselves, our families, and our greater community. Uh, just briefly by way of uh, background, I'm an internist and an anesthesiologist. Uh, I went to college and medical school at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. I did my residency in internal medicine at um, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, came back and did a second residency in anesthesia at UNC, then worked at Burlington Anesthesia Associates um, uh, where Dr. Drew was treated in his last, the last hours, Dr. Merrick worked there as well. I did a lot of time at the Cape Fear uh, Valley Emergency Room in Fayetteville, but I spent most of my time as a general internist uh, in Southeast Raleigh uh, which is predominantly black. And it was there that I really learned about disparities, um, about uh, food insecurities and about the lack of uh, some practical things like crosswalks and sidewalks and so forth that contributed to, uh, to the, the, the lack of good health there. 
you know, sometimes uh, we can go to the next slide. Sometimes we, we think about uh, healthcare uh, through the idealistic prism of altruism, the idea that doctors take the Hippocratic oath and everything is going to be equitable. But in fact, healthcare is just a microcosm of our entire society. Just like we see inequalities in, uh, in employment and housing, uh, just like we see inequality um, in, 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 in politics, then of course it exists in, in healthcare as well. But as Dr. King said many, many years ago, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and the most inhumane. Next slide, please. When we talk about healthcare disparities, we're basically talking about gaps in the haves and the have nots between different segments of the population. Now, examples are disease rates. We know that African Americans have a higher rate of hypertension than whites. Uh, preventive services, uh, we know that African Americans, for example, are less likely to get flu shots, less likely to get COVID vaccines, and of course, general health care delivery. And these inequalities are avoidable. Of course, we also have to talk about the social determinants of health, where you're born, where you live, where you work, your race, and your age. And of course, these are factors that we must consider as well. Next slide. Now to talk a little bit about the uh, examples that we're talking about, and all you have to do is Google disparities in medicine and you'll get hundreds of these, but I thought I'd list just a few of them. Uh, premature deaths from heart attack and stroke, i.e. those who are younger than 75 years of age are high in blacks and whites. Preventable hospitalization uh, rates are higher for blacks and whites. Premature birth rates for black infants are 60% higher than white infants. Uh, compared to whites, a lower percentage of blacks diagnosed with HIV were given enteroretroviral medications. Uh, compared to whites, uh, African Americans are less likely to get complex medical procedures like pacemakers and cardiac catheterizations. We also know that, that achieving health equality is all about improving health care, but I can't emphasize enough the importance of addressing posit poverty, living conditions, employment, racism, sex discrimination, and really empowering individuals to take care of their own health. Next slide, please. I had the privilege a few years ago of uh, interviewing Dr. David Satchers, part of my work at WRAL Television. And he pointed out a couple of things that I'll never forget. Number one, uh, as a global health disparities expert, he said that even though the United States has a great reputation in research across the world, we in fact, out of 17 industrialized nations, uh, industrialized nations rank at the very bottom in terms of our ability to provide primary care. We just don't do a good job at that. But another point he made, uh, which I thought was important is that he says the most underutilized medical intervention for improving health disparities is in fact, uh, lifestyle changes. And he carried around uh, four by five cards that he passed out and he had these uh, five things uh, that really are, are mantras for me and I talk to my patients about these five things virtually every day. Uh, number one is uh, moderate exercise, 30 minutes a day, five days a week, uh, five daily servings of fresh fruits and vegetables, avoiding toxins like tobacco and alcohol that are leading risk factors for heart attack, for stroke, for breast cancer, for prostate cancer, lung cancer, uh, responsible sexual activity, and of course, employing daily stress reducing techniques, uh, doing transcendental meditation, prayer, yoga, in order to, um, to, to help uh, calm uh, ourselves, particularly during these stressful times that we're undergoing right now. Uh, next slide. So we might ask ourselves, you know, you know, what are some of the medical disorders that so severely plague our community and what can we do to jumpstart improving our health? Now, I thought I'd talk about uh, just three areas uh, that predominate in my practice in terms of uh, causing uh, so much destruction of our health. And the, at the top of the list is high blood pressure. Uh, it affects about 41% of African Americans as opposed to 27% of whites. Of course, it's defined as the long-term force, the pressure of blood against artery walls. Uh, and if uncontrolled, it can lead to so many problems, heart attack, stroke, kidney failure. In fact, in uh, fact, we, we preach the fact that 90% of all people who have a heart attack have one or more risk factors for heart disease. In other words, if you present to the emergency room with chest pain, but you have no risk factors, you're not diabetic, you don't smoke, you don't have high blood pressure, uh, you're not obese, uh, your cholesterol is okay, you're likely not having a heart attack. 
uh, kidney failure. If you look at the kidney dialysis facilities, I talked to a kidney dialysis nurse recently and I said to her, I said, you know, uh, probably most of your patients there are all African-Americans. She said, no, Dr. Mask. She said, all of our patients are African-Americans. And they're there for two reasons, uh, uncontrolled hypertension and uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, the thing that always amazes me about high blood pressure is that most patients have no symptoms. Intuitively, we think that if we've got high blood pressure, the pressure's built up in our system, we gotta have a headache, we gotta be fatigued, we gotta not feel well, but in fact, I would estimate that 95% of the patients that I see have uh, no symptoms at all. Uh, for most patients with high blood pressure, there's no identifiable cause. There's some secondary hypertension, but most hypertension is generic is what we call essential hypertension. Uh, there's really no uh, specific identifiable cause other than genetics. Uh, risk factors are family history, race, obesity, tobacco use, alcohol, and stress. Uh, one thing we preach is that we want everybody to know their number best blood pressure numbers of blood pressure less than about 120 over 80. As far as treatment is concerned, we talk about limiting intake, limiting alcohol intake. As we talked about with Dr. Satcher earlier, a healthy diet, normalizing your weight, and of course, getting some exercise on a regular basis. And there are lots and lots of good medications out there that control you, that can control your high blood pressure. A lot of patients are in denial. They don't want to take medications. They want to do it on after hour. And we say, yeah, do it on natural, but we also realize in most cases, you'll need medications. I might also point out that 50% of all high blood pressure patients require two or more medications. They require two or more medications uh, to be treated. Next slide. The next demon is uh, diabetes. It affects about 11.7% of African-Americans, about 7.5% of Caucasians. It's the excess uh, uh, sugar in your blood, either um, there's too much uh, glucagon produced by your liver or your pancreas producing enough insulin. Uh, there's type 1 diabetes, which is genetic. Genetic is about 10% of the population. Type 2 is overwhelming. Uh, the most that we see, about 90%. Of course, there's gestational diabetes, which is associated with pregnancy, although a lot of those uh, mothers after they deliver will uh, be seen to have type 2 diabetes as well. Um, Dr. Uh, Buse, John Buse at UNC, He's the head of endocrinology, says something to me that I'll never forget. I'm going to pass it on to you. He said to me that we were all to normalize our weight. If we were all to normalize our weight, then type 2 diabetes, as we know it, would simply go away. Why do we worry so much about uh, diabetes? It's a major risk factor for heart attack, for stroke, for kidney failure, for blindness, nerve damage, and dementia. Oftentimes, we diagnose diabetes uh, without the symptoms. Of course, some patients come in with increased thirst and frequent urination, and they're hungry, and they're fatigued, and they've got to explain weight loss, and they got wounds that won't heal, and blurred vision. Of course, that points towards signs of active diabetes, but of course, a lot of the patients that we see uh, simply don't have any symptoms at all in the early stages. We make the diagnosis with a history and physical examination. We check your fasting blood sugar. There's also a test called a hemoglobin A1C, uh, which is the amount of glucose on red blood cells. If that number is over 6.4, then it means you've got uh, diabetes. Usually we want to see it on two different occasions to make sure there's not a lab error. And of course, um, uh, another test, if you've got prediabetes, if you've got a hemoglobin A1C from 6.1 to about 6.4, 6.3, of course, that's prediabetes. And of course, that's not a good condition as well. The treatment is healthy eating, exercise, weight loss, weight loss, weight loss. Uh, there are oral medications, uh, there's insulin. And of course, for some patients uh, who are morbidly obese, then having uh, the bariatric weight loss surgery will, uh, will help tremendously. And the final disease process I wanna talk about, if I can have the next slide, is cancer. Of course, we've seen a lot of cancer today. I spoke with a, a breast surgeon just yesterday who pointed out to me that there's a 94% survival rate for breast cancer if it's uh, caught in stage one. And we know that racism can contribute to health disparities by limiting the ability of many people to find cancer and to get treatment early. Uh, we know that black men are more likely to get prostate cancer than other men. Prostate cancer is the leading cause of cancer and the second leading cause of cancer death in African-American males. And we also know that uh, we tend to get uh, prostate cancer at an earlier age and tend to have more advanced disease when it's found. Uh, the risk factors uh, uh, include uh, uh, race, uh, includes uh, family history, and also we think that uh, diet high in fat contributes to it as well. 
we'd recommend that all of us uh, over the age of 40 get a digital rectal exam and a PSA test uh, uh, once a year. That's once a year starting at, uh, at age eight. Uh, briefly, uh, after skin cancer, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer and the second leading cause of cancer, cancer death in women. You know, the black women have, women have the highest breast cancer mortality rate. And we're seeing increasing trends, uh, particularly with uh, obesity in African-American women. Uh, we know that in America, about 78% of us are either overweight or obese. And uh, unfortunately, in African-American uh, women, they tend to be at the high end of that scale. We recommend uh, self and doctor breast exams on a regular basis, annual mammograms starting at age 40 or early with doctor's recommendations, healthy diet, and of course, regular exercise. And finally, I'll mention colon cancer, which is our most preventable cancer because that cancer, because that uh, cancer can be uh, diagnosed so early. It starts out as a polyp and uh, typically getting a colonoscopy early i.e. starting at age 45, uh, that can be uh, picked up, it can be removed, and of course, the colon cancer will then be cured. If I could have the next slide, please. And then I'll just conclude by saying that uh, healthcare disparities or uh, healthcare gaps in different segments of society are the most overlooked intervention, as Dr. Satcher points out, is uh, healthy lifestyle interventions. We want you to get regular checkups to know your numbers to get screenings on a regular basis. Be your own advocate. Be sure to ask lots of questions, uh, be vocal, uh, get educated, uh, go to websites, uh, a good website that I use a lot, for example, is cdc.gov. Uh, work to create networks that improve the healthcare of your community. Work to expand Medicaid. We've got some 500,000 uh, um, Americans, North Carolinians, who could benefit from Medicaid expansion if we would expand it. We need to food insecurity, and of course, uh, things, particularly with the COVID pandemic, create community vaccination sites and, and resource centers. So I'll stop there, uh, Rebecca, uh, Dr. Merrick. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to share some words with you. And if we have any questions, I'll take those. If not, uh, I see Rebecca, we're recording this. Maybe others will have an opportunity to see it, and we can communicate uh, via uh, email. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, any questions, anyone? We do have a question. Um, uh, what is the source for the recommendations around prostate cancer and the PSA test? Well, uh, there's some debate about getting regular screening. Uh, there's some criticism that says that uh, elevated uh, PSA tests lead to testing. Testing leads to an uncomfortable biopsy, uh, uh, bleeding, uh, poten potential infection, and so forth. Uh, the references that I quote most come from cdc.org. Uh, I speak with urologists uh, on a regular basis. Um, uh, Dr. Robinson, Carrie Robinson, for example, at Duke, uh, my uh, urologist I speak with as well. And uh, we want to make sure that we simply get people uh, evaluated. Um, one thing that's been a bit distressing for me is that a lot of physicians are not doing the digital rectal exams. This is anecdotal data, but I had a cousin who was diagnosed with prostate cancer about three months ago. His PSA test was absolutely normal. And a lot of us say, oh yeah, our prostate uh, specific antigen is normal and everything to worry about. But luckily his physician actually did a rectal exam. He felt uh, a nodule. Uh, the nodule was biopsied. He'd had a pretty aggressive cancer. I think it was a Gleason uh, uh, 8, 8 or 9. He ended up having uh, prostate uh, surgery. His prostate removed and he's doing much better right now. So uh, there's some debate about um, the, the benefits of screening and so forth. But my recommendation to my patients, uh, my recommendation to myself from my urologist, the recommendation, recommendation from my urologist is that we... Uh, we continue regular screenings as well, and particularly in, in North Carolina because we see so uh, much uh, prostate cancer in African-American men. It, uh, I might direct it, those that are interested to the phen.com, which is, stands for the Prostate Health Education Network. In fact, tomorrow evening at six o'clock, they're having a North Carolina rally in which our own very own uh, Valerie Fouché is speaking in. 
but it's uh, it's got urologists from Duke, urologists from UNC, and that is probably the best website I have seen. It gives you ideas of treatment, alternatives, and everything down to clinical trials. But it's it's very very good, and in fact their presentation tomorrow is a community uh, town hall event specifically aimed at North Carolina because our rates of prostate cancer in black men is so high. And this is the same organization that I've been plugging for two years now uh, that uh, has been working through mostly through black religious organizations, but I'd love to see them perhaps pair up with the NAACP and I'm, I'm working on that. That's the P-H-E-N. And tomorrow they actually, like I said, have a town hall at six o'clock. Any other questions from anyone? As I'm just curious, can I have a show of hands? Has anybody else heard the Dr. Drew legend besides me? And I know Alan is. What, what was that legend? The, the legend of the death of Dr. Drew, the circumstances surrounding his death. It's interesting. I know I really raised some hackles when I raised it up and when I was working in Burlington and asked about it. <laughs> Appreciate everyone uh, turning out tonight and Will and Alan and Rebecca, thank you for your help. And, uh, and, and hopefully since we re recorded this, we'll be able to broadcast it for those people who, who were not able to make it this evening. I think there is a lot of interesting information here this evening. Thank you very oh. much. Also, just wanted to shout out the rest of the health and wellness committee. Thanks for tuning in with us. Thanks for um, all your work uh, in the committee and also to our branch president, Donna Jones. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you, Dr. Merrick. It's fantastic. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.